When a murder investigation hits a wall, when it goes cold, it leaves the families of the victims in its wake, adrift. They are left tortured by the crushing loss of their loved one and are now faced with the distinct reality that whoever may have been responsible may in fact never be brought to justice. The void that is created in the hearts and minds of families as a result of the most violent of acts is one which can never be filled, ever. With me being one of the fortunate souls who's never experienced that type of loss in my life, I am left only to surmise what the arrest of a perpetrator gives the families, mentally and emotionally, beyond the knowledge of what happened to their loved one and that the person responsible will answer for their crimes. The only thing that they truly long for, the only thing, is to have their spouse, their son, their daughter, their brother, or sister back with them, as if none of the nightmare that enshrouds them ever took place. But alas, that cannot be. Yes, the offenders must pay for their crimes, and the victims and their families deserve the satisfaction of witnessing this happen. It has been said that the arrest and conviction and a term of life in prison without the possibility of parole, and in some cases the execution of the offender, that this provides the victim's families with some form of closure. But I just don't know if this is true, because it seems to me that there can never be closure. Not truly. That life was stolen and can never, ever be given back. In terms of actual relief, I'm not sure that is ever felt by the families of those who have lost someone to the hands of a murderer. Justice, that is what can and must be delivered. It is the best that our society has come up with in terms of attempting to make the victim's family whole. But justice, even in its most extreme form, an execution brings only so much satisfaction and relief to the victim's families. And that's because it's fleeting. The execution takes place, the killer's light flickers, and then is extinguished permanently. And the loved ones in that moment feel that justice has been served. But that void that I spoke of earlier, it's still there and always will be. I have long believed that justice may provide society at large with more than it provides those who matter most, which is, of course, the victims and their loved ones. What justice does in a case-by-case basis is that it ensures that the victim did not die in vain, that at the end of the day, the killer has been removed from society, never to walk among us again. That individual threat has been contained, but someone had to lose their life to achieve it. And for that, all of us owe a massive debt of gratitude. Now, there is a reason that cold cases continue to be worked by law enforcement and private citizens for that matter, oftentimes for decades after the crime was committed. And that is because the victims matter. They mattered then and they matter now. These cases certainly haunt the respective families, and they also haunt the cops that investigate them and just couldn't crack it at the time. As a society, we never stop seeking justice, no matter how long ago the crime may have been committed. Frankly, to me, the advent of the internet has served no greater sociological purpose than to disseminate information about these cases to the masses. This free flow of information has changed everything, and it seems that almost on a daily basis, cold cases are being solved, missing persons are being located, and the John and Jane Doe's are being identified through the use of genealogical DNA. We are truly in the midst of a renaissance of sorts of fighting and solving crimes. And it's incredibly satisfying to see because there is no statute of limitations on murder, And no matter the length of time that has passed, victims deserve justice. Unidentified persons deserve their names back. 
and missing persons deserve to be found. Now, one thing is for certain with this case that we are covering, and that is that the hunters, the Shermans, law enforcement, and the public all want answers, and they want them now. The only problem is they aren't getting them. And the Omaha Police Department seems close to reaching the end of its proverbial rope. And that, my friends, is a dangerous place for the collective mindset of law enforcement to be. Because desperate times call for desperate measures. I'm your host, Bob Mata, and this is episode 17. As the crow drives. We left off in two different places. Last episode, we began delving into Anthony Garcia's time as a resident in the pathology department in Creighton University. The reasoning behind looking so deeply into that subject matter is that it was this portion of Garcia's life back in 2000 and 2001 that would end up putting law enforcement on his tail. Many years after Shirley Sherman and Thomas Hunter were killed, and his time at Creighton seems to have started off swimmingly as he was doing well and appeared to be engaged with his continuing education in the field of medicine. Then, seemingly overnight, that all ended as Chandra Boutra entered Garcia's orbit. Now, I don't know the correct answer as far as keeping your mouth shut when your superior at work is giving you the business. I suppose for the health of your career, it would seem to be the prudent move. But as far as your own mental health and happiness, it would seem to be a bitter pill to swallow, especially if the pill is being administered on a daily basis. Either way, Garcia is not good about taking his medicine. So accordingly, the climate at Creighton is turning very chilly for him there as well. So that briefs you on the Garcia storyline. But what about Omaha PD and their continuing investigation into the Hunter and Sherman killings? Well, if you'll remember, that has taken them up north to visit the Russian in Canada. Both Warner and Robitaille left that sit-down feeling that at the very least, that the Russian had been evasive about certain things. And they are both perplexed as to why he would be lying to them about anything if he's not the guy. During the trip, the Russian supplied the boys in blue with his work schedule for the days in question. However, those papers are just that, papers. What they need is to speak with the individuals that can verify with absolute certainty the Russian was actually in Calgary performing the scheduled autopsies from someone that was in attendance with him. If that person does not exist, they may be onto something. So which avenue shall we go? Well, let's dig in and find out. Upon arriving back in Omaha, Warner briefs the team on what was learned during his trip up north with regards to the Russian and his potential whereabouts on March 13th of 2008. Warner explains that the task at hand is to now locate anyone that may have worked with the Russian on the 13th of March in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Warner tells the team that the Russian has given a couple of names of colleagues that may have been in attendance during any autopsy that he would have performed. After the briefing, Officer Eugene Watson approaches Warner and tells him that back in late March, at the beginning of the investigation, that he was following up on a Crime Stoppers tip that was regarding the Russian and his possible involvement with the murders. Warner was aware of Watson's work on the Russian as it was Watson who had tracked down the Russian's location and informed them that he was now living and working in Vancouver. Watson admits that it was early in the investigation and that he can't independently recollect what he learned, but that he was going to go back, check his notes, and to see what he can dig up because he distinctly recalls speaking with a detective from the Pittsburgh Police Department about the Russian. 
Warner tells Watson he needs the info as soon as possible because time is of the essence. Now, we have discussed how the flow of a police investigation goes on this pod on at least 100 occasions. All right, that's dramatic, but we've talked about it a lot. But just so you have a clear understanding, the police report that we are using to get the information to you is dated March 9th of 2009, almost a full year after the homicides. As we have told you many times, that date does not indicate when the work was done. No, far from it. All it indicates is when the actual typed report was prepared. That being said, without a report being generated and entered into the system, other officers working the case are not necessarily going to know that such information exists. And when you have half the force working on one case, that can be problematic. The following is what Watson had learned early on. In the beginning of the investigation, around March 21st of 2008, Watson made contact with Immigration Customs Enforcement Agency, commonly referred to as ICE, in order to try and get an exact location on the Russian. The ICE agent was able to ascertain that the Russian had arrived in the United States in 1999. He further informs Watson that the Russian had become a U.S. citizen in 2005 and that he had a Pittsburgh address in March of 2008. At this time, Watson is also provided with the Russian's social security number. Immediately after receiving this information, Watson jumps online and locates a number for the Pittsburgh Bureau of Police, Homicide Squad. He is shortly connected with a detective Foley. Watson briefs Foley on the homicides and inquires whether there's an agency that would be willing to check a residence of a potential person of interest in the aforementioned homicides. Foley tells him, of course. Watson hears Foley clicking and clacking away on the computer. Shortly thereafter, he provides Watson with the Russian's current address in Pittsburgh. Now, Foley doesn't have much more info other than when the Russian obtained his DL and the address that was provided to the Secretary of State which matches the address he earlier provided to Watson. Foley continues to click around and informs Watson that it appears that the Russian is not currently living in the apartment, but instead is subleasing it to another resident. Not a medical resident, just a person living in that apartment. Now, he tells Watson that he will track him down and set up an interview. Watson thanks him thoroughly and terminates the call. Now, according to the police records, months go by as Watson apparently is busy tracking down other leads. But as all those leads dry up, he circles back and gives Detective Foley a call in order to follow up. And this occurs on July 14th, 2008. Now, just a bit of a side note here. With respect to police reports and the information contained therein, as a defense attorney, I have always reviewed them with a fair amount of skepticism because... As is the case with this report, which was prepared nearly a year after the calls took place, dates of occurrence could be nothing more than a guesstimate, especially if a cop is trying to cover their own ass. If, say, something very important was missed early on, this is why we always, always requested the cop's handwritten notes. Hey, beautiful humans, Bob here. I want to talk to you for a minute about a sponsor that we absolutely love. And that sponsor is Shopify. And why do we love Shopify? Well, because they give small business owners and entrepreneurs the ability to be able to get their incredible products out to market with their own virtual storefronts and with only a minimal amount of effort. And then Shopify helps them become big businesses. Look, I'm dead serious here. Shopify has absolutely changed the game. As hundreds of thousands of businesses that may have never had the opportunity to get their products out to the public are now completely in the game. Brands like Death Wish Coffee, Magic Spoon Cereal, Gymshark all sell their amazing products through Shopify. And it's not just the small growing businesses that sell through Shopify. It's the big dogs too like Heinz and Mattel. But what else separates Shopify from everyone else that helps small businesses turn into big businesses? Well, 
How about because it's the number one checkout experience on the planet? Or maybe it's Shop Pay, which boosts conversions up to 50%. That means that less carts go abandoned and way, way more sales are happening. This is the bottom line. The businesses out there that sell more, quite simply, sell on Shopify. So upgrade your business and get the same checkout that Gymshark, Deathwish Coffee, Magic Spoon, Heinz, and Mattel use. So sign up for your $1 per month trial period at shopify.com slash dd. Again, go to shopify.com slash dd to upgrade your selling today. That's shopify.com slash dd. I can tell you this, as soon as our t-shirts and all our merch is ready, there's only one place on the planet where Defense Diaries is going to be selling their goods, and that, my friends, is Shopify. You know, to compare and contrast with the written report, and 99 out of 100 times, we were told they had been destroyed. How convenient. But I digress. So Watson gets Foley on the phone. They exchange pleasantries, and Watson inquires what, if anything, Foley has learned. Foley tells Watson that he was able to make contact with the Russian supervisor at the Allegheny County Medical Examiner's Office. He further tells him that this interview took place on April 4th of 2008, and during that interview, he learned that the Russian was scheduled to work on Thursday, March 13th. The supervisor had also told Foley that the Russian had taken off several days in March, but at the present time, he was not aware of exactly what those dates were and that he would have to check the log on the computer to see, in fact, when those occurred. Foley continues, The supervisor didn't really give us much. He told me that the Russian was married and had a child who lived in Alaska and that he had been in Omaha for four years. He also tells Watson that he had started working for the coroner's office in Pittsburgh on July 16th of 2007. Foley then informs Watson that he was able to make contact with the Russian in Pittsburgh on the following day, which would have been April 4th of 2008. His impression was that the Russian appeared to be very calm and open during the interview. Foley tells Watson that the Russian had told him that he had not been in Omaha since July of 2007. He confirmed with Foley that he indeed was familiar with Bill Hunter, but that he was not familiar with his wife, Claire, or what she looked like. The Russian also admitted to Foley that he had met their youngest son, Thomas, when he would bring him to the office on weekends. So let me get this straight. All the way back in April of 2008, Watson knew that the Russian was living and working in Pittsburgh in March of 2008. He had the name of his supervisor at the coroner's office and he knew that he was on the schedule on March 13th of 2008. But the supervisor could not confirm that the Russian was actually there without checking the log. He also knew that the Russian had taken several days off in March. He knew that the Russian did not know Claire or what she looked like, and that Hunter had a son who he had personally met on several occasions Yet, these two men somehow don't have any contact until July 8th of 2008. How does this happen? One place that will not indicate how in the world this happened is Watson's police report, which was not prepared until three months had passed after Warner returned from Canada, nearly a year after the information was ascertained. Now, this is complete speculation, but I have to believe that Detective Foley of the Pittsburgh Police reached out to Watson immediately after he made contact with the Russian and his boss. I mean, why wouldn't he? This wasn't a Pittsburgh case. He was actually doing the work for a fellow cop from a different state. It's clear that this failure to follow up for three months was all on Watson. This, my friends, is not what would be described as crack police work. Pertaining to the information that the supervisor gave about the several sick days that had been taken by the Russian, those dates had not yet been confirmed because, in Foley's opinion, the Allegheny coroner's office was not very good at keeping records of their doctor's schedules and attendance. Foley went so far as to check with both city and county computer technicians to see if they could determine 
the Russians' logout times. Wow, I mean, this cop is really going the extra mile. So much so that it makes me think that he probably made multiple follow-up calls to Watson. He wasn't doing all this just to kill time. He was working the damn case. A case, by the way, he wouldn't even get credit for the collar for if they make the arrest. It's not good. But wait, it gets worse. Foley then proceeds to tell Watson that the computer techs were able to determine the Russian's work computer shows him logging in on the morning of March 12th, the day before the murders, and it did not show a log off after that at any point. The next record that the techs were able to locate of the Russian logging in was on March 17th, 2008, four days after the murder. Now, Pittsburgh is 912 miles from Omaha and is a 13-hour and 49-minute drive. That's more than doable, folks. The final tidbit that Foley gives Watson is that the supervisor told him that the Russian is always asking for overtime and that he believes that he may have money problems as his salary at the coroner's office is only 52 grand a year. Watson thanks Foley and terminates the call and proceeds not to prepare a report for nearly 12 months. Now, I have no idea whether or not Watson spoke with Warner prior to the Canada trip. Maybe, maybe not. But if he did, he didn't indicate it in his report. And based on the fact that Warner did not mention the peculiar login information to the Russian when they were discussing his schedule, leads me to believe that this information did not make its way to Warner before he left Canada. Now, I'm not trying to pick on Watson here. Well, maybe I am a little bit. But when you have a disgruntled former employee who several of his co-workers described as potentially violent and one female co-worker stated that she was afraid to be in a room alone with him who also knows Bill Hunter, who also has met Thomas on several occasions and is not familiar with what Claire Hunter looks like. You just... Don't ignore all that information for 12 months, and you sure as hell don't keep it to yourself. On March 20th of 2009, Eugene Watson is... Hey guys, Bob here. I want to talk to you a bit about investing. Yeah, you know that concept of making your money work for you? Yeah, well, I was always afraid to invest because I knew nothing about it. I didn't know how to enter into the market. I didn't know how to buy stocks. I didn't know how much money I needed. I didn't know if I had enough money. I didn't know if I did have enough money who I'd give the money to to invest it for me. I didn't know what kind of stocks to buy. All of the excuses that I had. And frankly, when I was young, I just wasn't thinking about retirement. I wasn't thinking that far ahead. And I wish that today's sponsor, Acorns, existed 30 years ago when I was in my 20s because I would have been in the market now at this point for 30 years. So what is Acorns? Well, glad you asked. Acorns makes it easy to start automatically saving and investing for you, your kids, and your retirement. And guess what? You don't need a lot of money or expertise to invest with Acorns. In fact, you can get started with just your spare change. Acorns recommends an expert-built portfolio that fits you and your money goals, then automatically invests your money for you. And now, Acorns is putting their money into your future. Open an Acorns Later IRA and get up to a 3% match on new contributions. That's extra money for your retirement. How cool is that? Look, guys, long before Acorns was a sponsor of our show, I was using Acorns to invest my money. I thought the concept of using spare change from transactions to invest in the market was so ingenious that the minute I found out about it, I signed up and got an account. So if you were like me and you were hesitant about getting into the market, forget all that. Dive in with Acorns. Let them do the work for you. Let them do the research for you. Let them be your guide into investing your money. I did years ago, and I couldn't be happier. So head to acorns.com slash DD or download the Acorns app to start saving and investing for your future today. Paid non-client endorsement compensation provides incentive to positively promote Acorns. Investing involves risk. Acorns Advisors, LLC, and SEC Registered Investment Advisor. View important disclosures at acorn.com slash dd. Back on his computer, typing another report. Reading between the lines here, it's clear that Warner gently nudged his fellow officer that he needs to make up for lost time because they might have their guy. 
This report is also relating to the police activities that took place back in April of 2008. So it's another oldie but a goodie. Now, Watson reports that on April 8th that he reached out to a woman named Carla, who was the former co-worker of the Russians at the University of Nebraska Medical Center, where he worked briefly before he was at Creighton. Now, she is allegedly the person who informed the Russian that Bill Hunter's son had been murdered. Carla was agreeable to speaking with Watson. She relayed the following information. Well, I met the Russian while he was at the residency program at the University of Nebraska Medical Center between 2003-2004. I was the residency coordinator at the Department of Pathology, and he was a resident there. When he started, he advised me that he was looking for a place to live, and that ended up being in my basement for about three months. He had paid me about $300 a month rent. At the time, I believed that he was driving a two-door silver Honda Accord. I also believed that he had a wife and a child, but that at some point his wife just up and left with the kid. But I'm not 100% on that. One thing I can tell you for certain about the Russian was that he was always very secretive about where he was at, and he was an intensely private person. Watson then asked Carla if she'd ever seen or heard of the Russian becoming violent or aggressive with anyone, including herself. Carla tells him no, but that he always appeared mild-mannered and always seemed to want to please people. She continues, The Russian began to have problems with the residency program at UNMC in about 2003, primarily because of his poor academics, which I believe was related to his lack of the grasp of the English language. He became bitter about UNMC, and I believe that is what resulted in his expulsion. After that is when he enrolled at the pathology program at Creighton. One thing that I did think was strange, though, is that he would often joke about being part of the Russian KGB. I mean, I assumed that he was joking because he would often laugh when he was saying it. I mean, he did have a very, very heavy Russian accent. I'm not sure that this matters at all, but I also suspected that he might be gay. Watson asks her what made her think that. Well, it was basically because he was kind of feminine with his demeanor and his mannerisms and certain things that he did. Watson inquired if she had had sexual relations with the Russian. Slightly offended, she said no. We were just landlord and tenant and friends. We never even discussed a romantic relationship. Oh, but he did have a friend up in Vancouver that he lived with when he was up there. Uh, he's a very wealthy older gentleman and he lives very frugally. And he's openly gay. I actually stayed with him for a bit when I made my trip to Vancouver. He's a very nice man. She then supplies Watson with his name and address. Now, this was the gentleman that Warner had asked the Russian about him visiting back in March of 2008. And it was that part of the interview when Warner asked the Russian if he was gay. So it appears that Watson relayed that conversation and information to Warner, but held back on the far more crucial information that Watson received from Foley. This is a real head scratcher. Carla also confirms that she indeed sent the Russian an email when she learned of Thomas's death. She supplied Watson with both the original email and the Russian's reply. He thanked her and terminated the interview. This report would be the last on the Russian for the remainder of the entirety of 2009. The case has officially gone cold. And once a case goes cold in Omaha, it's placed within the cold case division this doesn't mean that the case is no longer being investigated by OPD, but it means that the priority it is given is much lower than an active case. Not one cop wants to give up on a case, but the sad reality is that crimes continue to occur on a daily basis, lots of them, and those cases must be worked in a timely fashion. And I can tell you this, there is no phone call that is more difficult to field than a call from a family member of a victim who are calling the detectives working the case to inquire as to any new developments in the case. And those detectives having to tell the family that they have some leads that they're following up on, but there's nothing new to report. Now, the person on the other end of that line knows what this means. The cop knows that they know what it means too. But it seems a softer blow 
than actually having to say the words. The trail has gone cold to the person who least wants to hear it. So as 2009 marches forward and the dreadful two-year anniversary of the murders approaches in 2010, Omaha PD renews its efforts of looking into the Russian. You see, while OPD never had nearly enough evidence to place the Russian under arrest for the murders, they also could not clear him either. And at some point, the Russian, being a person of interest, was leaked to the press. And certain investigative reporters took it upon themselves to dig into the case in the hopes that maybe, just maybe, they will uncover something that the police may have missed. So on March 10th of 2010, Sergeant Ken Kanger was handed an email from Sergeant Teresa Negron of the Homicide Unit. The email was from a man from the Allegheny Medical Examiner's Office, and he had been contacted by a reporter from the Omaha World Herald named John Farrick. Farrick was seeking documents, specifically the documents that OPD had requested from the same department back in 2008 relating to the Russian's brief stint in the Allegheny Medical Examiner's office. Kanger read through the email, then he picked up the phone and called the guy who had sent the email in order to find out just what exactly this reporter was rooting around for. The man on the other end of the phone informed Kanger that John Farrick from the Herald had called seeking the Russian's resume, his emails, a separation agreement, hours and days worked in the medical examiner's office, vacation time taken, conferences attended, travel expenses, meal reimbursements, and basically every other thing that he could think of. The man on the other end of the line told Kanger that they have a right to know act in Pennsylvania. But if Omaha has the case listed as active, then he may not have to release the information to Farrick. Kanger tells the man that Omaha PD's position is that the information can be released to Farrick, but that he's requesting that any information that is sent to Farrick is also forwarded to OPD. While Kanger has him on the phone, he inquires whether or not he is aware of any records that may show that the Russian was actually working on the 13th of March, 2008. The man tells him that his office's records would only show if the Russian had worked 40 hours in a week, but would not specify what days he had worked. Kanger thanked him, and terminated the call. Now, I'm not going to lie here. I find it very odd that as of 2010, Omaha PD has not followed up on verifying the Russians' alibi at all. I'm at a loss as to why this wasn't done, especially in light of the fact that all of their other leads had died on the vine. However, on June 10th of 2010, a meeting with Omaha PD is requested by the aforementioned reporter from the Omaha World Herald, John Farrick. Now, as a general proposition, cops absolutely abhor anyone other than other cops poking their nose into one of their investigations. Now, the current climate, as I sit here today, where home sleuths and podcasts that closely re-examine cases and that are not only helping law enforcement develop new leads, but in some circumstances are even cracking the cases, has led to a thawing of the proverbial cold shoulder that law enforcement has been giving private citizens as far as assisting in solving cases. But this is back in 2010, and that most assuredly is not the case. However, if we've said it once, we've said it a thousand times. Desperate times call for desperate measures. So OPD reluctantly agrees to meet with them, knowing damn well that they will be letting him do all the talking. At this point, they can't hurt, and who knows? Maybe the guy dug something up. So at around 1 p.m., Farrick enters the station and is escorted up to a conference room where he finds Lieutenant Kanger, Doug Harote, and Warner all waiting for him. Parties cordially greet one another, and then Harout simply says, let's hear what you got. Farrick, feeling far from comfortable, begins his presentation. He begins by explaining that he has been in the process of collecting documents from many different sources with respect to the Russian. He pulls out the documents that he received from Creighton, the state of Iowa, which, if you are not familiar, shares a border with Omaha, Nebraska, and the medical examiner's office of Allegheny County in Pittsburgh. 
Farrick explains to the cops what he believes are significant documents, and then begins delving into his theories on why he believes the Russian is the guy. The three cops in the room all listen intently, with blank stares plastered on their faces. Farrick ends up providing OPD with nothing, at least on its face, that they did not already have or had looked into. They thank Farrick and tell him to keep in touch if he comes up with anything further. Farrick leaves the room. They all wait at least a couple of minutes before they explode into uproarious laughter. A real Sherlock Holmes, that guy is, is the gist of the shit that the cops are talking. Months pass, and the Hunter Sherman investigation is firmly entrenched in Siberia. It's frigid, at least to Omaha PD, but it's certainly not cold to the Hunter and Sherman families. No, for them, it's still very much an open, gaping wound. Yes, they are still living their lives, but there's not a day that goes by when they do not think about what they have lost. 2010 comes and goes, and finally on January 11th of 2011, FBI agent Kevin Hytrek reaches out to OPD to let them know that he has some new information on the Russian that might just be of interest to them. Doug Harout returns the Fed's call. Agent Hytrek tells Harout that he received a call from a Dr. Matthews up in Canada and that this guy had called with some information about the Russian. Harout is interested. Tell me more, he says. Well, this guy is a pathologist up there in Calgary and apparently he used to work with the Russian and he had some pretty interesting information. This guy recalled Warner being up there back in 2008 for that interview with the Russian. And apparently, the Russian was recently fired from Calgary's ME's office because, get this, he was threatening people. What do you mean threatening people? Harout asks. Well, apparently the Russian threatened both this Matthews guy and his bosses. Okay, well, threatened them how? With suing them, beating them up, killing them? Harout inquires. Well, to be honest, this Matthews guy didn't give me all the details of the firing and the threats, but he did tell me that he was in the States a year or so ago at a medical conference, and the Russian asked him to bring back a meat cleaver and a knife back to Canada for him when he returned. At this point, Harout's mind is racing, and he has a million questions, none of which Hytrek is going to be able to answer. Sensing Harout's growing frustration, Hytrek says, look, this guy wants to talk to one of you guys, confidentially. Harout chuckles. I'm here for it. Give me the contact info. The Fed gives them the info, and they terminate the call. On January 19th, 2010, yes, seven days later, Harout reaches out to Matthews by telephone. This is the pertinent part of that conversation. Harout dials what he believes is Matthews' direct line. Someone answers. Hi, I'm Officer Doug Harada of the Omaha PD. I was given your information by an agent high track of the FBI. He claims he might have some information for me regarding a double homicide that took place back in 2008 here in Omaha. Ah, yes, thank you for contacting me, Officer. I'm Alan Matthews, not his real name, by the way. And I am an Assistant Chief Medical Examiner for the Department of Justice in Calgary. How can I help you, Doctor? Well... I've been in my current position since August of 2010, but I've been associated with the office since 2007, which happens to be when I finished my training at the University of Calgary Pathology Department. I then moved to Texas to work with the understanding that I would return back to the Calgary office to work at some point. Okay, Harout says, waiting patiently for this guy to get to the point. Well, in 2008, I met the Russian, and he had just been hired as the medical examiner to perform autopsies. Harout attempts to move this gentleman along. How was your relationship with the Russian? It was collegial, Matthews answers. Harout jots down the word in order to look it up later. The Russian was the staff pathologist, and I was his trainee. Though, I must tell you, while he was the staff pathologist, he could not pass the basic credential exams. And as the staff pathologist, he was in a position to actually write exams, 
but considering the fact that he wasn't even able to pass the basic exam, there was simply no possibility that he could write the exams. I see, Harad says, losing patience. I was also studying for the credential exam, so I was an asset for the Russian as we began preparing together because I had access to teaching and learning materials that he did not have access to. This was also a value to the Russian, but this was not a one-way street, no. He was of value to me as well, as I wanted to return to work in the Calgary office, and he was the person that would make that decision. So it was a mutually beneficial relationship. Harout is doodling on his pad as he listens, until Matthews finally stops talking. I understand. Uh, How about socially? Were you guys friendly outside of work? Hmm, somewhat. He would join my wife and I for dinner on occasion, and I would also invite him to after-hour training sessions with other trainees. Did the Russian ever make any comments to you about his past? No, but I knew the basics about his life and his training. I knew he was born in Russia and immigrated to Canada. I also know that he had dual citizenship between Canada and the U.S. This was all information that Omaha PD already knew. But this guy was calling for a reason. Harout tries to pull it out of him. Did he ever mention Creighton University here in Omaha? Well... I do recall that he made a comment that the training that he received in Omaha was substandard. Can you expand on that a bit? Harout asks. Yes, I can. Back in 2008, I hosted an after-hours training session which covered several hours of microscope mock exam formats. The Russian's role in the training was that he worked with the junior trainees. And the Russian, well, he scored lower on the training exams than even the trainees themselves. It was at this point that he made a comment about this being the direct result of the training director in Omaha and that he had received poor training there. It's always been my feeling that he never accepted responsibility for his own education. Instead, he blamed the program director for his problems. Harout sat up in his chair. Now we're getting somewhere. Did he ever state the program director's name to you? Matthews answered. No, he did not. But I must say, it was the Russian's habit to always blame others when things went wrong. It became kind of a running narrative amongst the other doctors in the office. The good doctor then proceeds to spend the next 10 minutes describing what little he knew of the Russian's time spent between Pittsburgh and Calgary and the challenges that he was faced with being the ME, primarily that being that Calgary was grossly understaffed. So, Agent Hytrek told me something about the Russian asking you to bring him a knife and a cleaver back from the States. Can can you tell me about that? Ah, yes, Matthews says enthusiastically. I fear in retrospect it appears to me to be a bit more sinister than him simply asking me to bring back a souvenir or two from the States. You see, I had an ongoing relationship with Miami-Dade County since around 1998 and I would make annual trips there to teach autopsies. So back in 2008, I was in Dade County in December for such a trip, and there were two colleagues of mine with me. Well, one day during the trip, one of my colleagues came to me with a package addressed to both myself and the Russian. I didn't open it, but over the next few days, two additional packages arrived, at which point my curiosity got the best of me, and I opened the packages contained within the later arriving packages was what I considered to be an assault knife and a meat cleaver and a dark colored jacket. I called the Russian immediately and I asked him what this was all about. And he told me that he had purchased the items off of eBay and that he wanted me to drive them back across the border. Harout is all ears at this point. Well, that's a rather strange request. Did you agree to do it? Yes, yes I did, and I'll tell you why. I wanted that Calgary job, and I knew the Russian was the person who would decide whether or not I got the job. So, accordingly, I packed the items and took them across the border with me. Perot ponders everything that he's just been told for a moment before he asks, How did the Russian know to send the items to Dade County? How did he know where you were staying? Well... I initially wondered the same thing. 
He certainly knew I was going to Dade County for the conference, but he didn't know where I was staying. So upon my return, I asked him just exactly how he knew where to send the packages. He stated that he had simply just Googled the locations of the conference and directed the packages to be sent to the hotel where the conference was being held. Simple. Did you ask him why he didn't have them sent to Canada? I mean, I'm fairly certain knives and cleavers can be sent from the States to Canada, Herout inquired. Why, yes, I did. He told me that he did it that way because he didn't want to pay the import and custom taxes. However, I do want to mention that the packages that contain the knife and the cleaver and the jacket, well, those were only in my name, and that was done without my permission, and to be honest, it really, really freaked me out. And there was one occasion when I was trying to get some wine from the U.S. and was having a difficult time getting it into Canada. So I told the Russian about my dilemma, and he advised me that he had a Russian friend in Montana that he would have things shipped to, and then his friend would drive them across the border. After he told me this, I could only think, well, why in the hell didn't you use this friend to mule your knives? That would certainly be a red flag for me, Herout responded. Yes, it was. In the early months of 2009, I was speaking with my boss and I told him about the Miami incident with the knives. And he informed me that it had not been that long ago that the FBI had been to Calgary to investigate a double homicide in Omaha. When I heard this, I immediately became mortified, thinking that I was in some way unwittingly aiding a murderer. I have to tell you, I, I was petrified. Harout thought about it for a moment before answering. Yeah, I, I can see how that would be a very scary situation for you. Let me ask you this. Did you ever talk about the Omaha investigation with the Russian after you learned of it? Oh, God, no. I wasn't about to let him know that I knew anything about what had happened in Omaha. As a matter of fact, I did everything in my power to limit my exposure to him. We no longer invited him to my home for dinner. I avoided him like the plague at the office. I always thought he was a bit of an odd duck anyway. What do you mean? Asked her out. Well... He's socially awkward, and he's not the warm and fuzzy type. I had no interest in being friends with him. After all that occurred, I was now convinced that the man was going to kill me. As a matter of fact, in the spring of 2009, I was planning to move to Dallas for a period of probably about eight months, and my wife was going to stay back in Calgary for the period of time that I was working in the States. I told my wife that if the Russian ever showed up to the house, that she was immediately to call 911. Harout took it all in, taking copious notes. When he finished writing, he asked Matthews, Is there anything else you want to tell me? Harout heard Matthews audibly exhale over the other end of the line. <sighs> yes, there is. But you're going to have to wait until the next episode of Defense Diaries to hear it. All right, time for a few shout outs that I like to do every couple episodes because I uh, couldn't do this without these people. Darren, the EP, the man in the middle, the master of sound. Thank you. Thank you for everything you do. You're the best in the business, my brother. To Taras Horluski and Ryan Gack, thank you for the super dope music that is the soundtrack to our pod. To Alex Carver and my beautiful daughter, Courtney Reese, thank you so much for our socials and all the amazing graphic arts that you guys are putting together for us. It's fantastic. I really, really appreciate it. And to my beautiful wife, Allison, thank you for basically running our practice alone. So um, I know that's a huge amount of work and I really appreciate you giving me the opportunity to try to make this thing into a monster. To all of our Patreons, we love you guys. Your contribution, no matter how much it is, whether it's $5, whether it's $25, is beyond appreciated by both Darren and I. We love you guys so much. We are trying to give you guys some more content. Uh, I think we're dropping another bonus episode this week uh, is The Hope. And we will continue to try to mount more and more uh, extra goodies for you guys in there. So patrons, we love you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And finally, to you, all of our weekly listeners, you guys, we love you. We just couldn't be doing it without you. And as you know, without you guys, I'd just be an old man talking about an old case. Talk to you next time.